Business etiquette in the new digital age can be really tricky. Stick around while Deborah Thomas shares some insights on how to deal with some of the tricky situations we find. Welcome to the AP Now podcast, the podcast that covers trends, insights, and emerging issues impacting every accounts payable function. Your host, Mary Schaefer, is the founder of AP Now, a B2B digital information and learning company focused on all issues related to AP. Stay tuned as Mary and her guests discuss the business intelligence you need to ensure a cost-effective, technologically efficient, fraud-resistant, regulatory-compliant accounts payable function. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Welcome to episode 86 of the AP Now podcast. I'm Mary Schaefer, AP Now's founder, and I'm really thrilled to have with me today, Deborah Thomas Nininger, which I probably said wrong, which is kind of interesting since we're here to discuss business etiquette, what you don't know could cost you dealing. I'm almost afraid to have this conversation because I suspect I'll learn a lot. Like Deborah's probably going to tell me I should have learned to pronounce her name before we got on, but be that as it may. (laughs) So Deborah has a saying, which I really like, and I thought it would be a great way to kick off this conversation. Deborah says she teaches soft skills because life is too short to not know what to do. As I said, I couldn't agree more, although I'm a little fearful about what I'm going to learn. But let's dive right in, Deborah, and let's start talking about virtual meetings. Great. Well, and yes, business etiquette, etiquette in general is changing all of the time. And frankly, people have asked me this question many, many times in my 20 plus years of training. And it is, who makes up the rule? Oh, that's a good one. (laughs) And I say to people, it's you, it's me. Because by the very behaviors we embrace, we're saying, this is what we subscribe to. This is how we should do it. And then if we discard something and we don't think it's important, we stop doing it. And then that etiquette guideline just falls out of favor. And now we have a whole new group of things to think about virtual (laughs) etiquette. And oh goodness, the list is long. Everything from people arriving late, people not dressed appropriately, people eating their breakfast as the virtual meeting starts, (laughs) slurping their beverages, having the dog in their lap, snoring, children running around. It's a little bit of everything, Mary. So like what would be like three uh, guidelines or three uh, things that people do wrong that you wouldn't expect, uh, that you might not think about? I think one of the top ones that I'm hearing from my clients, people are appearing to be with both their attitude as well as dress and maybe in a sundry of other things. They're not coming across as professional Mm -hmm. as if they were back in the office together. Mm -hmm. And considering that offices were very business casual or just downright casual, (laughs) then goodness, what are we experiencing, right? So I think that's the top number one. People aren't bringing their best to their meetings Mm -hmm. and people are questioning their dismissiveness. And that's impacting decisions being made and frankly, how people are perceived. Mm -hmm. That's not a good situation. Okay, so the next one, which I really liked um, that we wanted to talk about was uh, verbal responsibility. I thought, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think as soon as someone hears verbal responsibility, various people come to mind. Yes. We think of people in our lives, et cetera, and we question why did they say that? Or did they not know who their audience was? And are they not aware of the fact that that's offending a plethora of people? So there's the offense perspective. But I take a step back and I ask people, do you think people would give you an A for having verbal presence? So that means in any situation, whether it is a virtual meeting, a phone call, or when we get back together in person, would people describe you as having that gravitas? The person who says the right thing at the right moment 
And it's not that they are not being authentic. They're just more careful with their word choices. Yeah. Far more judicious. Yeah. So, I mean, I always say, uh, everybody says something that they shouldn't at some point in time. Sure. Present company included. I've got my hand raised. Um, and I am less inclined to criticize somebody about that because uh, I've had my foot in my mouth more often uh, than I'd like if the person is willing to apologize. Right. Yes. And that's the own it factor. And I suggest to people, if you do have the foot in the mouth moment, we all have myself included that the best thing to do right away, don't let it go on and on, handle it immediately. Take your foot out of your mouth with a very <laughs> swift apology. You own it. You acknowledge it. You pass no buck. You pass no blame. And the less you say in that moment, the better. So apologize and then don't explain. Right. Don't oh, Because people aren't going to buy the explanation. Right, right. But instead, right. if I say, I am terribly sorry, I realize what I just said and I own it. And I must say, I won't say it again. And that's it. That's it. And then move on. Yes. Move on. Because you want everybody to forget it. Or right. at least I do. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so before we get to, uh, to Deborah to talk about the issue that really intrigued me, and I was disappointed when you said we were going to do a third. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'd like to invite you to subscribe to this channel. And if you're watching on YouTube, ring that bell at the top. All right, Deborah, to the issue that I really find intriguing, let's talk about body language. Well, there is a number I'll give you, and many people find it hard to believe when I share it, but yes, we each have the potential of communicating with our nonverbal communication, our body talk in over 700,000 different ways. Oh boy. Yeah, so just a few things to consider, and I tell people it's really quite simple because the important thing is to know what you're sending as far mm -hmm. as your signals. That way you don't have to worry about yourself, and it frees you up to better read the signals of others. Mm -hmm. because you should know what it means when a person puts chin in hand, finger up the side of the face. What does it mean? As I'm doing it. <laughs> well... It is a good signal. Okay. Whenever someone has finger up the side of the face or chin in hand, that is a signal of evaluation. It okay. does mean I'm listening to you. It does mean I'm paying attention. And it means I'm thinking about what you're saying. It may mean you agree with me, but it also could mean, no, you're digesting it all, but you won't be agreeing with me. Okay. So there are signals that will say, I'm bored. I'm disinterested when people start playing with their jewelry, tugging on bracelets, clothing, playing with their hair, taking their glasses on and off. There are a number of fidget signals that will say you've lost them. Mm -hmm. They're no longer with you. They're not focused. People who can't sit still in a chair and they're twirling all the time. <laughs> and I tell people this also applies to the virtual meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Because now without being in the same room, your body language actually is harder to read. And studies are showing that decisions are taking longer to make because people cannot read the room the same way. And reading the room is nothing yeah. more than starting with body language. That's the first thing people make a decision about. Not what you're wearing. Yeah. It's about, are you approachable? Right. Are so, you listening to me? So... You think, and, and, and I'm sure you're right, because I certainly have no expertise here, it's harder to read body language when we're like this Yes. than if we were sitting uh, across uh, having a cup of coffee. Yes, that's what, not just me, that's what the behavioral scientists <laughs> have concluded during our past year of experimenting with all of our virtual meetings. And it's actually more exhausting as well, which means the facial expression when you are tired, you sometimes look unfriendly. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. So people shut down if they think that you're not really with them or paying attention right. or focused. 
So you said one other thing when we were chatting before we did this, when we were talking about body language, which it actually threw me, but then I thought, oh, I can't wait to hear what she has to say. You said something about body language and uh, sometimes your body language says you're not approachable. Yes. And for a lot of people, especially people who are more left brain, people who might be more passive, people who are reserved, Often their facial expression is very, very hard to read. They keep a very blank facial mm -hmm. expression, somewhat neutral, and you don't know how they're feeling. You don't know if they're with you or not. Mm -hmm. You don't even know if they're listening. And that can sometimes come across as dismissive and you're not invested in the moment with them. So a lot of people take exception to that and they push back and they push away. And that certainly impairs effective communication. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know I saw a, um, a, sl a video of a talk I gave and I was horrified at the end of it because I never smiled throughout the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, my God, I was having a good time. <laughs> I looked like I was dying up there. <laughs> well, and this is where I tell people as you're developing any new habits, because the brain loves to develop habits. Well, you have to tell the brain what to do. So I give my brain post-it notes. So I look at my post-it notes that will remind me to do something. And then my brain goes, oh, you should be nodding your head. So and you would so have a, that's how it happens. So you would have a smile post-it literally on the screen? Yes, I would. Absolutely. And what would you do in person? Well, in person, you can have, if you're at a if you're at a lecture and you're giving right. me that presentation All right. from a group, you could have something there as well. But there needs to be something that you could use as a trigger word in your presentation to remind yourself. Also, it helps you to do purposeful pauses that will <laughs> remind you of anything that you're forgetting yeah. and it allows you to kind of reboot. Right. I like those purposeful pauses. I call them my transition slides in PowerPoint because yes. you know I'm from New York and I can talk very fast and it makes me slow down. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. And remember, it takes people four times longer than your spoken word for them to digest everything you've said. Oh, boy. So, and I'm off to the races. <laughs> yes. You're off to the races and they're still back at the gate. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Well, that was that was really very interesting, Deborah. Um, I know you said you're working on a few books. I can't wait um, till they come out and we can talk about it. Uh, we can talk about them some more. Um, if you like this episode, you'll probably like episode 75, where uh, Rebecca Holdery joined me to talk about professional development and developing your pref uh, professional network. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, a card will pop up to the, to the left with a link. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Deborah, for joining us. Sure. Um, and as always, we really appreciate those thumbs up and shares. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm.